Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer, and today I have the pleasure of company of Pandit Satish Kumar Sharma ji from across the pond, and we have three very important topics to talk to you about. This is all the different things that's happening in the United Kingdom. Without further ado, let's welcome the guest of the day, Pandit Satish Kumar Sharma. Pandit ji, namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Pranam ji, namaskar, Jai Shri Ram, and uh, Om Guru Bhyo Namaha to you. Ayurji, it's Om, uh, lovely to be here with you. Um, we have Om some Guru Bhyo Namaha and Ram Ram to Pandit Ji. As always, I, uh, I, I, I cherish our conversations because there is so much that I learn from what is happening uh, over in the United Kingdom. And you've got a very nice ecosystem going there, if I may say so. Pandit Ji, what do you have for us today? I told our viewers that we have three things. Viewers, first of all, please like this channel, please share and subscribe to our channel if you have not already done so and also you need to click on the bell button for notifications over to you sir three things that we want to talk about let's start with the first one wonderful so let's start first of all with the one issue which has been causing all of us a great deal of discomfort and disruption and uh, has threatened the well-being of so many people this um virus and its impacts and the current situation here in the united kingdom we'll talk about that a little bit i think i'd also like to just touch upon this new john hopkins report that came out yesterday so we'll come to that very shortly the second thing i think we should touch on is some new developments um, in parliament here in the united kingdom as you know the british parliamentarians are always ready to throw stones at anything hindus and Bharat does uh, that um, subliminal Hindu phobia has reared its head again. So we'll touch base with that. And um, the last thing is uh, our dear friends at Oxford University. Um, again, a den of Hindu phobic vipers, shall we say. They're hosting a conference. And lo and behold, would you like to guess what the subject is? It's caste. So of course. <laughs> the, the caste caravan has now come to Oxford University. So those are the three things I'd like to touch on today. Wonderful, sir. And and again, this is toolkit, toolkit, toolkit. I'm going to keep <laughs> drilling this thing in. You guys are not learning from your mistakes. You have people who inadvertently leak out the information. You never seem to learn. That's okay. It's all good for us. First off, sir, the first topic that you mentioned about the status of COVID and what does the Johns Hopkins University uh, report indicate to us about the transmission, about vaccination, about just about mm -hmm. everything that there is to know about COVID. Mm. Over to you, sir. So here in the United Kingdom, we've actually had a, uh, a dramatic uh, set of events. As you know, the United Kingdom was, for the last six weeks, really escalating the amount of pressure and the amount of resources that were being devoted towards vaccinating everybody. Boosters, 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 second booster, third booster. And there was even talk of a fourth booster only a couple of weeks ago. But then we had this situation where 100,000 health workers said, we are not going to have the vaccines at all. Um, in fact, they don't refer to it as the vaccines. They refer, some of them refer to it as experimental gene therapy. And you can imagine 100,000 uh, members of the National Health Service suddenly disappearing from the workforce would be devastating. So the, de the deadline the government had given to them was that either you get vaccinated um, by April, otherwise you will lose your jobs. So the lines were drawn, you know, it was like high noon at the OK Corral. But the doctors held their nerve and they said, no, um, we're not going to be forced to take vaccines. It's contrary to our principles. It's contrary to medical ethics. And so we're not going to do this. And last week, in all, to all intents and purposes, the government has capitulated and has started the process of introducing legislation to get rid of this mandatory vaccination for NHS workers. It's worth reflecting on what this actually means, though, because it, this has repercussions. The ramifications are very, very significant. And I'd just like to, to touch on one or two of those. Sure. You know, when, when this COVID thing started, Sridi, do you remember the scenes from China 
the horrific um, examples of people just keeling over in the streets and people being boarded up into their apartments to to try and isolate them so there was an air that this was horrific now if you were a, a researcher if you were part of the medical establishment if you were part of the um, pharmaceutical establishment you would have probably started your work and said okay we need to develop something and then in order to trial it we need to have one group who we can give this to and then we need another group who are not going to receive the vaccine conventional um, trial sort of uh, processes Imagine if you'd advertise saying what we're looking for is 100,000 people who are going to be exposed to the, to the virus on a daily basis. Um, they're going to be provided with minimal protective clothing. Um, the group is to include all races, genders, ages, BAME and white people. Wouldn't that be an incredibly powerful data set? And how would you convince people to sign up if you then said, oh, and we're not going to pay you anything? That would be a fantastic control set of data. Nobody did that. But the reality is that the doctors became that control data set. They became the people who, on a daily basis, were being exposed to infected uh, members of the public. They had very, very limited PPE. Uh, you probably remember at the, uh, the beginning of all of this, we were all applauding them, clapping them, and uh, encouraging them, and thanking them for going, for being on the front line and taking risks with their lives on a daily basis. So this was the control group who basically took that risk. Daily exposure, no protection, and no preventative um, vaccine. So I would have really wanted to assess the data in its entirety. and. If 100,000 people who use their clinical expertise on a daily basis to recommend treatments and health treatments to their patients, they use that expertise, we rely on it, don't we? Every time we go to the hospital or we see a doctor, the doctor goes through a process of assessment, of scrutiny, of diagnosis, of trying to refer to available procedures, and then comes and makes a recommendation that this is what you should and this is what you should not do. So the 100,000 medical practitioners go through the same process themselves, the process that we trust them to apply, and they go through the same process and they come to the conclusion that they do not want to participate in what they've called an experimental gene therapy. Why should we not respect their decision and their expertise that we rely on on a daily basis so we have those two factors one is they're applying the same reviewing and expert opinion process to come to a conclusion that they would in our interests and two they're choosing to remain unvaccinated untreated and yet have daily exposure this is an incredible set of data the most valuable data set you could possibly imagine and yet nobody has turned their attention to it. So this is worthy of scrutiny. And if you think about that a little bit further, what does it tell us about the risk assessment that they have conducted? They've conducted a risk assessment of being exposed to the virus, and a risk uh, they've conducted a risk assessment of being exposed to the treatment. And they've come to their considered medical opinion that being exposed to the virus is less of a risk than of being exposed to the vaccine itself. Now, this is the group who have challenged the government and said no to this. And so the government have basically capitulated and they're going to make arrangements for them to continue. But where does that leave everybody else? Remember, these medical practitioners have now been exposed to the most um, dangerous environments for almost two years. They have antibodies, they've been tested for antibodies, and so they have what natural immunity, as we're beginning to call it. And yet that natural immunity is not being applauded. Where's the research which says, how can we heighten and improve natural immunity? What can we do to make that um, even more potent and even more resilient? 
the silence is deafening, isn't it? It's not being done. And so that raises the first question as to why is that not being done? And um, obviously, rather than following the science, if you follow the money, then you come to a completely different profile and a completely different understanding. But that is uh, a really troubling and worrisome red flag. It, um, it does, by the way, show us in a slightly better light because you recall that um, we announced that um, I had issued a recommendation that mandatory vaccinations are completely contrary to dharmic principles. And the freedom, the karmic duty to make considered informed opinions and decisions, that's a fundamental part of Sanatana Dharma. And the imposition of beliefs, of projections on another human being is totally a dharmic. And so I think we're going to be proven right in, in the, the long, long term, term. I think we're going to be proven right. So this is where we are with regard to this COVID. I'd say one last thing. Those people who have natural immunity from a previous COVID infection, but who do not have the vaccination, they're in a bit of a limbo land at the moment because they have the antibodies, but they can't travel. They are imprisoned. They're being denied that fundamental human right of uh, being able to move, of uh, being able to travel. And yet the science doesn't indicate that that is required or that it's necessary. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that next. I think that is the last group, isn't it? Those people yes. who have said, we have natural immunity, we do not have the vaccines, we have antibodies, and that group really shouldn't be discriminated against. The science doesn't require them to be discriminated against. So on what basis are they being discriminated against? And I think this will lead us to that critical key point, which says that, the science is not saying discriminate against these people and the science is not saying that vaccine passports give any medical or scientific benefit whatsoever and so that fundamental question mark which people have asked from the beginning is is this really about people's health the public health or is this about getting everybody onto some sort of a, a digital medical passport and that question, I think, is going to be on everybody's mind in the coming days and the coming weeks. So let's see where we are with that. You um, asked me to comment on the um, John yeah, Hopkins, Hopkins report. Yeah. And as I'm sure everybody knows, John Hopkins has a, uh, a wonderful um, reputation for robust data and scientific research. And my understanding is that yesterday they issued a report which assessed the degree to which the measures governments have taken forced lockdowns all of those sorts of things restricted and travel the degree to which that was successful and it uh, contributed to diminishing suffering and reducing deaths and i think they came back with a figure that the the impact of all of those lockdowns you'd be stunned to hear was no more than 0.2 percent benefit hmm. the cost of it we know is is vast I and mean, the cost of it in terms of people who had potentially got cancer and it was never diagnosed, people who were scheduled for operations, life-saving operations, and they were not treated. The costs of those um, incidents is going to be vastly in excess of the 0.2%. And so this also then raises a question. If we add to this, you know, the, the, the definition for the vaccine has recently changed, hasn't it? The, the medical definition of the vaccine, which has served the, the world very well for the best part of 30, 40 years, if not more, suddenly that definition needs to be changed for these circumstances. Suddenly, the pharmaceutical companies were demanding freedom from liability. Yes. Exemption from liability. You know, suddenly we were being told, believe the science, as opposed to question the science you know believing the science is not scientific questioning the science is purely scientific add all of these things together and the picture that we're being presented with it it really does require us to exert a lot of scrutiny i think we're at a pivotal point in the the life of the human family at this moment in time and unless everybody starts to ask these reasonable questions unless everybody starts to come together um, as the 
truckers have decided to do. They've obviously done this sort of analysis and decided there is something wrong here. And we do not want to be going down this route of mandatory vaccinations and forced passports. These are civilizational issues. And I think everybody, um, and especially us Sanathanis who've been around for a long time, you know, we have a voice in this, we have a, a stake in this. We need to step up and start to ask these questions ourselves and demand um, answers. So that's where we are here in the United Kingdom. Um, I've understood today that Denmark have also cancelled the pandemic. So there are nations where the change is coming. And equally, there are nations where the change is being resisted <laughs> over on the, your side of the pond. Absolutely. I have a last question before hmm. we go on to our next topic. Sweden never did any lockdowns. Hmm. How did it fare? Well, um, somebody came out with a remark the other day that this is no longer a pandemic of the unvaccinated. It's a pandemic of the vaccinated. And there is research now coming out, which is saying that if you have natural immunity and you have a sequence of boosters and so on, it can actually harm your natural immunity. And so, you know, Sweden's decision, I think on a daily basis, is going to perhaps change. Everybody was saying, oh my goodness, how rash and how um, uh, the risk is too much. I don't know. The science is seeming to lead us to, to consider that uh, the natural immunity is probably the best solution to this. Um, on the one hand, we have data, scientific evidence. On the other hand, we have projections. You know, and it's these projections which are the uh, the new feature, aren't they? It used to be follow the data, follow the science, follow the evidence. And now it's no, 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 act on the basis of our projections. And we had Sir Neil Ferguson, one of the most respected um, data and uh, uh, statisticians. He predicted that we were going to have half a million people in hospitals dying within the first few weeks. It never materialized. And so these projections, I think, are the worry. Sweden completely ignored all of the projections. It made its own choices and said, OK, we'll follow the data. And I suspect that they will come out on top once this is through. Well, fascinating stuff. Um, Satish ji, uh, we, let's take a look at this new law, or not law, but a policy that California State University System has adopted. Uh, just for our viewers' benefit, 23 universities eight um, online campuses or, or what I call as offline learning campuses. All of them, this is the largest student body in the whole world. They have now decided to have some sort of a policy for anti-discrimination based on caste. Now, what is really, really surprising is that this whole thing was arrived at looking at one flawed report from a company called Equality Labs. The founders, I don't think have ever set foot on India. These people are perceived to have been suffering from caste discrimination, where I don't know. But all sorts of ho holes in this, this presentation, it has been already roundly criticized for the way in which they conducted their study. And there was an overwhelmingly uh, more, uh, more properly done work from Carnegie foundation which has been completely ignored so cal state i don't understand what they were smoking mm -hmm. when they did this thing <laughs> see satish ji you have seen something similar to this happen in united kingdom for our viewers can we just kind of walk down the path how do you see this thing because to me this is atrocious because this is my hard-earned taxpayer money being put to work for a wrong reason. And guess what? If they get sued by somebody, it's again going to be my money that the university will use to defend themselves. So please disabuse us of this horrific thing called caste that is now being used by a few motivated individuals, in my opinion, and trying to carry the entire community along in a way that it should not be going. This is just my thought. I'm sorry to rant a little bit. Yeah, I, I would like to hear your thoughts, sir. Um, as you know, thank you, Sriji. As you know, here in the United Kingdom, we were targeted in the same manner. We were targeted on the basis of allegations and accusations about who we were. 
they, there was no evidence. It was just, this is what this group is like. The question, is that true? Is it fair to um, generalize to that degree? Is it fair to assume that because of a surname, we can identify and profile every aspect of your being? Um, you know how, how contentious profiling is. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement came out of a rejection of law enforcement profiling black young men without evidence. So profiling is a dangerous, dangerous task. It's not a step that any wise legislator or legislative body would, would go down. Here in the United Kingdom, we managed to convince the opposition that this was unjust. It was bad law. And being bad law, the consequences would inevitably, um, they would come, karma would work its way through, and the consequences would be that the public purse would have to bear the, the cost of those consequences. Legislators in the Conservative Party, they recognise that, the government. And so we were able to convince them of that. And we were also able to, shall we say, disband the kangaroo court that had been assembled. Now, tragically, in um, California, the kangaroo court that was assembled, it was not, it certainly wasn't an open hearing. It certainly wasn't a balanced opportunity for all parties to contribute their opinions. It certainly wasn't one in which the individuals making the ultimate choice, they had not been available to both parties to lobby. It was clear that a lot of information, unjust, unfounded accusations had already been shared. And so when the trustees of the California board sat, it was evident that decisions had already been made. And it was remarkable. How many, I think, there were some 60 or something like this, and it was a unanimously passed decision. It's extraordinary, isn't it, that no impact analysis was done. Yes. No consultation with the community who were going to be affected by this was done. All they did is they received allegations, they received, as you have said, a grossly inadequate report, and they were groomed. As far as I can see, those trustees, they were groomed. They, their emotions were manipulated. Their desire to be saviors of, a, of an allegedly victimized um, uh, community were, were played upon, and they made the wrong decision. Equally, I think to some degree, our own community didn't manage to get um, a coherent response together in time. But that's okay. You know, innocent people who are not guilty, there is very little reason for them to actually come together en masse because you, you tend to believe the evidence will be considered. And if there is evidence, we will be given an opportunity to scrutinize it and present our understanding of that. None of that happened. So that California State Board, um, it was in essence a, a classic kangaroo court. And what they did was what kangaroo courts do. They, they have set the stage effectively for any person who claims to be a Dalit to point a finger at any person who is not identified as a Dalit and to, to claim victimhood. You know, it enshrines the assumption of guilt into policy. And that is completely contrary to the American Constitution. It's contrary to every um, tool of justice that has ever been produced. How on earth can you possibly accept a principle which says a group of people, by virtue of their surnames, are going to be presumed to be guilty and let's have them prove their innocence? It's a complete and utter nonsense. Now, in that lies a great opportunity, because once somebody manages to communicate to this board of trustees exactly what they have done and the trap that they have fallen into, the, um, shall we say, they have been invited into a killing ground, a legal killing ground. They're unbelievably vulnerable. And I, I think somebody should communicate that to them. Once that's done, then the board has the opportunity to reflect on its on its uh, circumstances. If a case is brought, let's say that an allegation like the Cisco allegation occurs and a case is brought, it will be such a, um, shall we say, a legally flawed um, case. And I think it can be very skillfully dismantled, rejected. 
and defeated. And again, at that time, the consequences and the liability will accrue to the board. They will see that what they have actually done is they participated in a propaganda exercise whose intention is to dehumanize and to stigmatize a community, the American, the Indian American community, who are not proven to be guilty at all. They, this, is, this tarnishes them, this harms them, this is a libel, this is a slander, and all of those things should really be brought to the fore. So I have been asked to participate and contribute um, an opinion and perhaps engage with this issue. And so I'll come back and uh, we can have a conversation about uh, any developments in the near future. But um, I would say to our American Hindu community, to the American Sikh community and to the whole American Indian diaspora, they really need to pay attention to this because it is something which is an injustice and it's a, a principle has been developed which has never existed in American jurisprudence before. And it's a great opportunity for the community to come together and actually have a success. This is waiting to be won. Um, so it's there. I would love to see some uh, movement in that direction. Let's hope so, sir. And now let's take a look at the third thing that mm. we wanted to talk about, a very important topic, I might add, that <laughs> Oxford University has now got into the act of bashing Hindus. It's not enough that there was a de dismantling global Hindutva conference online that took place uh, on the sometime a few weeks ago. We, we've talked enough about it. And now Oxford is doing it. So these are like clockwork. Somebody is sitting and saying, here, flip this switch. Now, good. We've got some response now. Let's try and see how much amplification we get from that. Let's pivot to this bigger thing. And now they are, uh, uh, you know, at uh, Oxford. Panditji, this place, I don't know why is, you know, I think the, you know, Hing, Hinka Dabba, Asafotida. <laughs> to me, Oxford is a prime example of an Asafotida box that has no more Asafotida left inside. That's how it seems to me. Please disabuse me. Tell mm. me I'm wrong and, and I'll be happy to correct myself, sir. Sriji, you mentioned at the outset the magic word toolkit okay so this is a toolkit being played out it's it's not coincidence that california state passes this ridiculous policy and then within a matter of days suddenly there's an announcement that oxford university is going to be discussing caste and the census now anybody who has studied this subject and the 1921 census that the british um, uh, colonialists conducted will know that the roots of caste discrimination and friction in the Hindu community, they stem from the manipulation of the census. Now, here we have a group of academics, and it's the same bunch of academics who try to denigrate and vilify and dehumanize and stigmatize the British Hindu community with their attempt at legislation, our equivalent of your equality labs, as it were. It's the same, um, the usual suspects. They're holding an event, what they're trying to do is to apply some sort of academic pressure on the Indian government on the census. There is a census in Bharat and there is pressure being applied saying, oh, we want to see caste recorded on it. Now, caste is one of those divisive things. And the government's position was, well, we're a secular community. We're a secular nation, right? We don't believe that um, Indians should be subdivided in this manner at all. And yet what this little group have decided is that they, they've genuinely convinced themselves that they can hold a kangaroo court. Um, and please bear in mind at this conference, it's not one where there are opposing views being made available to students. It's a select group with pre-published Hindu phobic anti-India um, articles and works to their credit, gathering in an exercise of diminishing the respect for the Indian government and the BJP particularly. Um, and it's masquerading as some sort of an academic gathering. It's the same as they've been doing for quite some time. Well, we are going to see some interesting developments from that. And um, Panditji, as always, a pleasure to listen to you and, and, and have a very illuminating conversation. 
and today's is no exception. And, and again, I look forward to uh, the COVID developments in UK. Certainly, they seem to be ahead of the, uh, you know, the curve here because US is still thinking of lockdowns and what have you. And, and, and it is a self-inflicted wound, in my opinion, by the Biden administration. Anyway, let's, let's set that thing apart. It's going to cost them probably dearly at the polls. Whatever it, it's it's a it's now we, we can't do anything about that. But yep. certainly your thoughts uh, on sharing what's happening in in United Kingdom invaluable. Thank you once again, and we will see you again very soon. Namaskar. Namaskar, ji. In my closing remarks, I would encourage everyone to engage with these issues. You know, there are many things that our watchers can do. You've already suggested that they should subscribe, and of course they should. You know, part of being involved and being educated about these is to share and spread what you have learned. And so everybody does need to engage with these issues actively, and then we will start to make a change. Um, we will see, hopefully, and I'll give you uh, an update in the near future, on issues to do with the British Parliament and how it's continuing. Some aspects of it are continuing their anti-India rhetoric. We have brief gills issue still working its way through the House of Lords is still issuing its nonsensical statements um, as though it was still the colonial power and uh, Bharat was still the, the jewel in the crown. Many of these developments are going to come to a conclusion in the next few days and next few weeks. So um, thank you for the opportunity to share those opinions. Um, I look forward to continuing our journey into following the science and um, also following the money because I think a lot of revelations are coming down the wire. Sriji, thank you as always. Jashi Ram, everybody. And uh, Om Guru Bhyan Thank you very much, Sri. Namaskar. Namaskar. Namaskar.